Let's let everybody pop in here. We'll get started in just a minute here, folks. Let everybody join. All right, we're going to get started. This is a part of our college and career readiness series. I'm TJ Berry, Deputy Superintendent here in the Appaquinemix School District. I'm joined by Mike Trago, who's the Supervisor of College and Career Readiness, and we have Dr. Zach Mabel with us, who I'll introduce in just a minute. Tonight is about what parents can do to um, inform themselves and prepare for students with the through line between what we have with our pathways into a college um, setting, some school after some schooling uh, after high school, which we're going to be talking about here in a minute, um, and then a way back into the economy. We run these series to inform our parents um, to add a benefit and to really make sure that people understand. How, how high school and beyond works um, in 2023 and for our graduates in the future. Um, after the intros, the format of tonight, uh, we're gonna ask Dr. Mabel to share some of his research. He's gonna do that briefly in the beginning of our uh, event. And then I'm gonna ask him some questions about his research and about what parents need to know um, if you have questions as you're listening, we invite you to drop those questions in the chat. We're gonna be monitoring those. So then in the second half of our hour, we can answer as many of those questions as we can. We're not gonna to get to all of your questions, that's for sure, but this is gonna be recorded. It's gonna be put up on our website and we'll also have our information on a slide afterwards so that if you have a question for, for Mike or for, for myself, uh, regarding the district and the supports we have in place for college and career readiness, we can answer those questions. Um, and if anything came up that Dr. Mabel uh, presented on and, and you would like us to get in touch with him, we can do that as well. So tonight we are joined by Dr. Zach Mabel. He's a research professor of education and economics at Georgetown University Center on Education and Workforce, where he leads research projects to promote educational opportunity and economic mobility. His work is motivated by the goal of improving college and life outcomes for all Americans in service of achieving a vision of shared economic prosperity in the United States. He's got a bachelor's degree from Brandeis University, a master's in public policy from University of Michigan, and a doctorate in quantitative policy analysis from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And I met him at a conference where we were talking about pathways and how pathways are the future of, of high school. And he presented on some data that I thought was really significant and something that we wanted to add to our college and career readiness series so that we can better inform our parents about what we're trying to do in the K-12 arena to prepare kids for what Dr. Mabel's about to tell us is, is the future of economic security in the United States. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Dr. Mabel. I'll thank you for your time. Um, and have you present your screen and share some of your work with our listeners, um, both on the call and, and, and after production here. And, and then I'm going to ask you some really hard questions after that. So let's get started. <laughs> Sounds great. Well, first of all, let me just say thank you for uh, the invitation to, to uh, be part of, of the webinar. Uh, a lot of the work uh, that, that I do and that, that we do at the center is really geared towards, you know, policymakers, uh, and, and, and practitioners, but, but less, you know, uh, a, a dialogue with uh, students and families who are really navigating uh, these decisions. And it's, it's refreshing to have these opportunities to actually uh, know that, you know, there's an opportunity to have our work um, hopefully be helpful as people are actually making these exciting, but uh, understandably uh, at times daunting decisions. So um, again, just really excited to be here and, and um, appreciate the opportunity. 
I'm going to share my screen uh, so that I can walk through uh, some of the research um, that that we've been doing at the center. Um, and let me enlarge this if I can. And are we good to go? Good. We okay, see perfect. It. Great. Excellent. Um, so um, let me start by saying that um, at the Center on Education uh, and, and the Workforce at, at Georgetown, where, where I work, uh, we've done uh, a lot of research examining uh, which education training and, and work-based pathways after high school uh, lead to economic opportunity. Um, and what the potential is for making those pathways uh, both more accessible to more people uh, and uh, which pathways, uh, frankly, offer the greatest opportunity uh, for, uh, for uh, having the best chance of, of achieving financial security uh, later in life. Um, when we talk about economic opportunity uh, at the center, uh, we uh, oftentimes are talking about having access to a good job. Uh, so I want to start by defining what we mean by a good job, and then we can take stock of who's working in good jobs in uh, our economy today uh, and the pathways uh, that are taking people there. So uh, understandably uh, and justifiably, there are many, many different components to, to a good job. This, of course, includes how much you earn, but it also you know, can include whether you have access to uh, employer provided uh, benefits, what opportunities for uh, career advancement the job uh, has available to you, um, how satisfied you are in the job. There's many, many different uh, facets that one could, you know, define uh, a good job by. And, you know, I think uh, every one of us would probably uh, choose, you know, to weight each of those factors um, differently according to our own preferences. At at uh, the Center on Education and the Workforce, we, uh, for simplicity, define a good job uh, based on pay alone. And so by our definition, good jobs pay at least $43,000 a year for workers who are younger than uh, 45, and they pay at least $55,000 a year for workers who are 45 and older. We think of good jobs by this definition as providing the earnings that are an entry point to achieving economic self-sufficiency. But the reality is that most workers who are in good jobs, in fact, earn a lot more than those thresholds that I just mentioned. Uh, and so uh, in, the in the entire economy, workers in a good job, over half of them earn, it, earn more than $80,000 a year. And among Workers in good jobs who are early on in their career at age 30, for example, over half of them earn more than $64,000 a year. And we know that workers in good jobs are much more likely to have access to uh, employer provided health care, retirement accounts, uh, and other benefits at work. Now, there are some reasons to actually celebrate progress that we've made uh, economically in our country over the last uh, several decades. So uh, this figure here shows uh, the blue bars show the share of the jobs in the entire economy in the United States that are good, according to the definition that I just explained. And the gray bars show, uh, show the share of jobs in the economy that are lower paying and, and not good, according to this definition. And so we see going back to 1980, for example, uh, half of the jobs in the economy uh, would be considered good by our, by our earnings definition. Today, that has increased to 60, almost 60% of, of jobs uh, being defined as good. And we project based on where the economy uh, is headed, that that share is only going to be increasing uh, over the next several years. So we're going to we're going to surpass 60% um, within the next within the next decade, uh, according to our best our best projections. Now, another way that we can sort of see uh, progress uh, that we've made over time is by comparing workers early in their career across different generations. So the yellow line in this figure shows the share of early career workers, workers in their between their mid twenties and their mid thirties, currently in in our current uh, in our current workforce, uh, who have a good job. Okay, so it's the share of early career workers currently who have a good job, 
And by comparison, the blue line shows the share of also early career workers who are from the baby boom generation. So these are early career workers, not today, but in the 1980s. Uh, and it shows the share of those workers who had a good job at the same age. And so if you move all the way to the right-hand side of this figure, right around here, we see that in fact, there is a much higher share of early career workers at age 35 today that have a good job compared to early career workers several decades ago. But what we also see from this figure is that it's taking a lot longer than it used to to latch on to that first good job. And the reason for that is because our economy has transformed. And so since the 1980s, our access to computers uh, and the economy's dependency on technology and computer-based uh, developments, along with global competition, have really transformed the economy such that our routes to economic success in the workforce today now operate through primarily post-secondary education and training. And what this has done is it's added years of time on the pathway from youth economic dependency to adult economic independence. And so while it was the case uh, a couple of you know, generations back that uh, young adults were largely able to find uh, good jobs in their 20s, now it's taking more than half of young adults uh, in, who are in the workforce until age 30, if not longer, uh, to secure a good job. And so uh, when we actually look at the levels of education that workers in good job have and how that has changed over time, we see some really, really, really dramatic uh, changes in the makeup of the workforce who have good jobs. So the yellow bars in this figure, uh, again, show the workforce in good jobs in 1980. The blue bars show the workforce who are in good jobs today. And the orange bars show what we expect the workforce in good jobs to be uh, within over the next several years uh, in, in 2031. In 1980, almost half, 47% of workers in good jobs had no more than a high school diploma, and only 33% of workers had a bachelor's degree or higher. Compare that to today, where only 18% of workers in good jobs have no more than a high school diploma, and 60% of workers in good jobs have a bachelor's degree or higher. And again, we project that these, these changes where the share of workers uh, who have a high school diploma or less who have access to good jobs is gonna make up a smaller and smaller share uh, of the entire workforce in good jobs. We project that that trend is going to only continue over the next several years. And most of the economic opportunity in terms of having access to good jobs is gonna to go to individuals who have the highest levels of education in our economy. One of the one of the concerns around these patterns that we see, excuse me, <laughs> is that there are so many individuals in every high school cohort who are not choosing a pathway that is likely to lead them to this economic uh, opportunity. <laughs> excuse me. So this includes, for example, almost 5 million young adults between the ages of 18 and 22, who are not expected to pursue post-secondary education or training after high school, their likelihood of having a good job at age 30 stands at only 30% today. And almost 60% of young adults with no more than a high school diploma will find themselves working in low paying jobs in their early 20s. And for that 60%, their prospects of working in a good job at age 30 stand at just 14%. So there is a large group of individuals who uh, maybe don't understand what the, what the makeup of the economy looks like and where the real opportunities to um, have access to uh, good jobs lies, who are not setting themselves up to compete for those good jobs uh, in the future. Now, one of the... Uh, 
additional pieces of research that that we've uh, been working on at at the Center on Education and the Workforce is to ask, how would people's chances of having a good job change if you move someone who was not planning on pursuing education or training after high school and you changed the pathway that they chose and instead you put them on some sort of post-secondary education or training pathway, how would that actually change the likelihood uh, for those individuals of having a good job? And when we, when we conducted that research, uh, what we found was that the, the best ways of increasing the likelihood of having a good job in early adulthood operates through either completing a college degree or completing a sectoral training program that uh, provides you with high skills that are in high demand in the labor market. And so, for example, if you were an individual uh, who graduated from high school and did not pursue any education or training after high school, and you found yourself working in a low paying job in your early 20s, if instead you completed a sectoral training program and that program provided you with placement assistance to move from working in a low paying job to working in a high skill, high demand job that was available to you through this sectoral training program, we predict that your chances of having a good job at age 30 would increase on average by 11 percentage points. Likewise, if you were an individual who was not planning on pursuing any education or training after high school, and instead you enrolled in a certificate or an associate, associate's degree program in your early 20s, and then you completed a college credential by your mid 20s, your likelihood of having a good job at age 30 would also increase by 11 percentage points on average. But the single greatest source of potential for increasing the likelihood of having a good job is to earn a bachelor's degree if in fact you are academically prepared after high school to enroll in a four-year degree program. And so we estimate that if you were someone who is academically prepared to, to attend a four-year college, but you chose not to do so, and instead if you did enroll in that program in your early 20s and you completed that college credential by your mid-20s, your likelihood of having a good job at age 30 would increase by 25 percentage points, which is a very, very large amount uh, if, in fact, uh, you changed that pathway that you were on. So uh, that was, those are a lot of numbers that I just walked through, and, and, and I'm, I'm going to uh, stop so that, that we can um, have a conversation. Um, but let me just uh, sort of summarize by saying there, in fact, are uh, many pathways uh, to setting yourself up to um, achieve financial security after high school. It doesn't all operate through the bachelor's degree, uh, but certainly given the centrality of education and training after high school uh, to having access to a good jobs and to the economic opportunity uh, that, that, that that opens for you, uh, it really now has become more crucial than ever to chart a path after high school that does include some additional education or training that will prepare you uh, to gain access to a lucrative career that also then uh, provides you with uh, hopefully advancement opportunities uh, in the future. Thank you for that, Dr. Mabel. I think just a simplify it there at the end with your summary what your research really demonstrates is that the notion that you can come out of high school our high schools are great high schools but what we're trying to do with our pathways is to prepare kids for a successful career in their future and to get from high school to that successful career there has to be a path and that path can be an industry certificate at the, at the ground level and then moving up from there an associates and a bachelor's degree are the best ways to get yourself into the economy in a way that will provide you with financial security in the future. And if you don't do that, 
it could be detrimental to your ability to have a sustainable wage. Is that, is yeah. that a no, summary that's a, in a nutshell? That's a perfect, that's a perfect synopsis. Uh, and then with the, uh, disclaimer, I guess I would say that there's a lot of nuance, right? So I was presenting, um, averages, uh, and, and averages are, are useful, but they also hide and they hide a lot of, of important nuance and information, right? So, um, it is also the case that we know that, um, there are about 28% of workers with, uh, no more than a high school diploma who earn more than the typical earnings of someone with an associate's degree. And there's about 30% of workers with an associate's degree who will earn more than the typical earnings of someone with a bachelor's degree. I think it's important to uh, elevate that because again, I don't, I don't want to over overemphasize that uh, the only pathway to economic success is through the bachelor's degree. And, you know, that's the only path uh, that you should go down. There's a lot of variation in earnings potential by field of study, which leads to a lot of, you know, a lot of opportunity that is certainly available for people who are uh, not interested in pursuing a bachelor's degree. Uh, but a lot of sort of navigating that requires uh, having access to information to know where those opportunities exist. Uh, and And I think, frankly, if you know, you're a little confused about what path you want to choose or what sort of program you're interested in studying, that's where, uh, you know, falling back on averages can sometimes be helpful. And you realize that, well, if I really am qualified to uh, pursue a bachelor's degree, and I'm not quite sure what I what career I want to go into right now, um, that might be your surest bet. Because the workforce uh, of today and the workforce of tomorrow is rewarding workers with bachelor's degree more than it's rewarding anyone else. Yeah. And so you kind of, I mean, a lot of parents listening to this, trying to make these decisions for, with and for their children, you kind of don't want to make that bet now and into the future if you don't have to. If you have a viable option, maybe a family owned business, and there's, you know, a little bit shorter of a path to economic security. Um, certainly it's still reasonable to think that that's an option, but it's not going to work for the majority. And certainly if that path, that particular path doesn't exist without that, you need to have a path after high school, um, which is something that we try to do in this district, set students up for success in not only being able to go to a rigorous, a uh, highly selective university, um, but to be able to have an industry certificate, in some cases coming right out of high school, and to be able to use even some of the credits that they earn in high school to get into an associate's or bachelor's degree. I want to talk about what that costs and the burden on families who are not considering college because of how expensive it is, because I think there's a path for, for everybody. Uh, we need to be clear about that. But before that, um, I just want to talk about the mindset shift here that you've been discussing, because I think um, there has been a push for, um, for this concept that you can get a good paying job uh, outside, you know, after you graduate from high school and you can go into the workforce and that's not what your data is showing. So how do we reframe that for people in a way that makes sense? Yeah. Um, so uh, I will say that um, uh, I, I would recast it to say it's not that it's not it's not that it's not possible uh, to you know uh, be very very economically successful with no more than a high school diploma. It's just very unlikely, right? Um, and so part of the, I think, challenge is uh, you hear stories of, um, you know, the person that that has done really, really well for themselves uh, with with, you know, after they graduated high school and, and, and they didn't uh, they didn't uh, invest in any further education or training. And there's going to be there are always going to be examples of folks like that. Uh, but the reality is that most people who are not investing 
beyond their high school education are not going to find themselves uh, in those jobs. And so one of the, um, you know, one of the sort of recent uh, practices in hiring that is getting a lot of buzz right now is something that's called skills-based hiring. Basically, let's, uh, that for, for employers, let's post jobs uh, where we are going to specify the types of skills that we are requiring for a worker to do, but let's not mandate that that worker have a certain level of education, right? And so there's sort of a movement away from requiring jobs to um, that, that applicants need to have a bachelor's degree, for example. Uh, and the reality is that uh, even when employers are posting jobs that are not requiring these credentials, in the workforce, in the applicant pool, there are many people who are applying for these jobs who, in fact, do have these credentials. They're just not being required. And employers haven't actually changed their hiring practices. So if you are someone who, if there's a job and it's posted and it's available to, to you, uh, and let's say you have, uh, let's say, you know, you, you're you coming out of high school and, and, and you, uh, you don't have an industry certification, you don't have an associate's degree or, or a bachelor's degree, well, you're very likely going to be competing for that job, especially if, if it's a high paying job, with people who do have industry certifications, with people who do have uh, higher levels uh, of education, and employers are preferring those candidates and those are the candidates who are getting the job. And so what we see when we look at the trends of high paying occupations that are available to people, even without a bachelor's degree, most of those jobs over time have been going to people who have bachelor's degrees. Um, and so this is this is sort of a reality of what is it taken in, in the economy today to compete with other people who are vying for the same jobs as you, uh, and um, and and frankly, this is where it is it is increasingly valuable, and you're only increasing your chances of of getting of landing that good paying job if you have that industry uh, certification, if you have that education to make you stand out from another candidate who might be absolutely qualified to do the job but they don't have the credentials to do so. And so they're not being recognized for it. Yeah. So, it, I mean, it's, it's almost as if the misnomer there comes from the fact that there are jobs in the economy where you don't need some path after high school. And so people may be mistaken to think, well, that that's what I'll be able to do. That's the path that I'll take versus a certificate associates a bachelor's of masters and then they're competing with people who do have those and those are the folks who are getting the job so on paper it looks like yeah you can do this without the certifications and 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 degrees and even that's not true um so it, it's it's fascinating but i think that when i mentioned mindset shift i still think in a lot of our schools and a lot of parts of our communities in America, there is still the concept that you're gonna be fine if you just do well in high school and graduate from high school. And that's increasingly not the case. And I think that's the message that we want parents to, to take away tonight, to take advantage of our pathways in Apoquinimic as an example, to get into a degree program um, and to have the best chance at financial security. I think that's one of the primary messages. Now. Financial security only comes if you've gone through a program that you can afford and you're not strapped to to limit because you spend all this money on getting your degree. So let's talk a little bit about affordability of the future for people to get that bachelor's degree if they want it. We know we're preparing students to be able to do it, but that then becomes their, their choice. And a lot of people see it as a dead end when they look at a you know one year's bill at forty thousand dollars and you just said at the low end of the of the of the the spectrum they might only make forty three thousand dollars with the, the certificate so can you talk about 
um, you know, your thoughts around college and affordability in the future, and then we'll share a few things too on our end. Yeah. Um, so, so a, a, a couple of uh, of thoughts come to mind. Um, one is, uh, and and uh, uh, hopefully, uh, <laughs> you know, hopefully those of you who are listening um, appreciate this, and it's not the first time you're hearing it. Um, but it is very important to distinguish between what colleges are putting on their website as the published price to attend an institution, uh, which is some, you know, sometimes we call that the sticker price and the price that you actually are expected to pay uh, to attend uh, that institution. And, and oftentimes um, uh, colleges uh, are, 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 subsidizing considerably uh, the cost to attend an institution. And it's not always clear how much you as a, as a student or a parent will actually be expected to pay. But there are actually resources that are available to help you get a better understanding of, for someone in your particular situation, what would it cost me to attend uh, a particular institution? So. One resource that I would uh, encourage folks to to visit and to become familiar with is uh, the College Scorecard. Uh, this is a resource that's put out by the Department of Education. Uh, the website I jotted it down is um, CollegeScorecard.ed.gov, um, and there's a ton of information that's available there for every college, and oftentimes for the programs uh, that are offered by uh, each college. One of the pieces of information that is provided in on that website is for any institution that you might be interested in, or if you're not interested, it can actually generate a list of institutions for you to consider, uh, but it provides not how much does it cost um, according to the, on the, on the school's website, what is this? It's, it doesn't, it's not the sticker price. What the scorecard will actually show you is what is the out of pocket cost that you would be expected to pay based on your family income to attend that institution. And again, because institutions are oftentimes seriously subsidizing how much it would attend, that can provide you with a better indication of exactly uh, how much you would have to pay in order to uh, pursue uh, a, a college certificate or degree program. Also linked on the college scorecard for any institution is what is called a net price calculator. Uh, every college is required by the uh, Federal Department of Education to provide a net price calculator where you can actually put your own information in and received a very, very personalized estimate of how much you would be expected to pay out of pocket to attend a particular institution. And so uh, it's imperative when making any sort of plan for yourself or for your student uh, to understand what the expected cost to you will be and not to be basing decisions off of what the institution publishes the full cost of attending that institution um, will be. So that, that's one sort of long, uh, long uh, response that I, that I uh, have to your, to your question, TJ. Um, the other is that uh, at, at the Center on Education and the Workforce, um, we actually uh, produce uh, what we call a, uh, a return on investment uh, for every uh, institution that basically operates, uh, 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 that offers a, a, a college degree. Um, and we, so we basically use information that is provided on that college scorecard website. And we estimate uh, both taking into account how much you would be expected to earn when you graduate from that institution and what your what the expected amount that you borrow from attending that institution would be and we take both of those things both of those pieces of information into consideration and then we actually estimate for every institution how much is the investment worth potentially to you uh, for choosing to attend that institution and then we rank colleges based on uh, that estimated return on investment. So you can actually go to our website and look up 
uh, our rankings based on um, ROI and get a sense of for institutions that you might be interested in because either you know they're they're close to home or they offer a program that you're interested, which ones uh, offer the highest return on investment according to to the work that we've done, um, and that you know would likely give you a, a really great chance of 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 coming out with earnings that are going to be able to cover whatever uh, monthly loan payments you have if in fact you're taking out loans uh, to help pay for college. Yeah, so that's a that's a good resource and a great notion for people that the sticker price is not always the price. Um, and typically, they take your financial um, your financial statements into account as well. A number of universities, and the the more need you have, the the more money you'll get. Um, that's another generalization, but it's helpful for parents to know that. I think it's also helpful for people, especially first generation college goers, people who wouldn't have typically gone to college to know that there are lots of options on the table, community colleges. Um, but this is, you know, beyond just talking about Delaware and Appaquinimic, but community colleges and institutions that are available at a, at a much lower cost even open enrollment institutions that will take um, students without a strenuous application or, or selection process. That's also, I think, helpful for people to know that your options aren't limited to the big box uh, universities that um, are typically named by kids because they, they know the names of those universities, but they don't know um, the, the smaller, you know, lo more local options. And in Delaware, Delaware um, has done a really good job of being able to provide students with free and near free college in some of our institutions across the state, depending on how you enter and what degree programs you go into, as a matter of fact. And uh, we're going to do a better job of putting that right into our catalog so that when people are picking their high school pathway, they're also seeing what their your their graduation pathway you say post secondary but we say you know after graduation just so folks know exactly what we are talking about here that they have a high school pathway and they have a pathway that's going to get them into the economy after high school that's not just i have a high school um uh, certificate which you've explained tonight is not a, a, a likely uh, avenue to financial security and DJ, I just put it in the chat for those that are listening. Aposccr.com slash scholarships has um, is a link to our college and career readiness page where parents can go, students can go look at the Inspire Scholarship and the SEED program. That's perfect. Um, we'll put QR codes and, and all kinds of things in the book coming up that'll bring uh, families back to that. I think this has been great, enlightening, on uh, 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 Fantastic information. I mean, I think one place to end is that uh, I've read a recent statistic that um, money can't buy happiness except for up until I think it said $75,000. After $75,000 a year, it's not going to buy you happiness. But um, until you get there um, and we're talking about good jobs and we're talking about a good life, I would just like to end with this notion that we're trying to help people um, live a happy successful existence where they're not going to struggle and uh do you have any words of wisdom there about that piece of data the seventy-five thousand, and you know marching towards that uh yeah so uh uh first first thought that came to mind was i'm i'm not sure after uh, all the inflation that we've seen over the last several years if 75 is 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 still the inflection point but but the but the broader point i think is absolutely true that um, there's, there's uh, up to a point you, you want to earn more because without it, you really are financially insecure. Uh, but money is not going to buy happiness. And then at a certain point you're, you know, you've, you've, you've earned enough that you can actually, you have the privilege, uh, and the bandwidth to entertain, uh, other aspects of a job and your life. Um, that are going to be most fulfilling. That's absolutely true. Um, I think this is this is one of the reasons why when we talk about economic opportunity and we talk about a good job, we're really thinking about what is essential 
you know, what do you need to make for a livable wage? We're not talking about what do you need to make in order to be in the top 5% of earners in, in the country. Um, we, we leave that, you know, that's work for, for others to do, but this is really about um, how do we, how do we just open the doors to opportunities so that uh, people have the means to um, make the choices that they want to uh, over the course of, of, of their life and be set up to, uh, you know, handle an unexpected uh, financial challenge or obstacle uh, that, that comes in their way. Um, it really is uh, about having access to a good job that is going to set you up to, to be able to do that. Um, and it really is, you know, fundamentally about charting uh, a path that involves some additional education or training after high school um, that's going to set you up to, to be able to, uh, to land one of those good jobs that's going to set you up uh, to, uh, to, to do what you want in life and to be able to withstand any une unexpected hurdles that come your way. Well, thank you, Dr. Mabel. I think we can end there. I see Mike's answering some questions in the chat. I don't know that we've had any come through that he hasn't been able to answer um, for our families. Is that true, Mike? Can we can we end here or? Yeah, um, I just want to point out and end with um, all these videos. So this is one um, video in a in a series, college and career readiness series that DJ and I I do on a regular basis. So. Um, we have a website, apoccr.com. I'm going to put that in the, the chat um, where you can connect directly to um, this video as well as um, all the other videos that we've done in the past. Yeah, it's good. Just trying to help families, keep families informed, help families make the right decisions um, at home and, and in school. And so, again, I want to thank uh, Dr. Mabel for your time. I think the message here is clear. We have to have a path after we graduate to make sure that we're financially secure in our future. Uh, thank you to all of the families who tuned in and listened to the uh, live uh, webinar and to those of you who are watching this um, afterward. Please, please, if you have any questions, reach out to us. Our information is going to pop up on the screen here in a minute. And if there's a part of our series that you would like to know more about, even if it's you know, somewhat deep dive into some of our pathways um, with our, our pathway instructors, our, our work-based learning program, anything that you would like to know more about that we're trying to do to create this avenue that Dr. Mabel's talking about for after high school and, and into the economy and, and a successful, good job and, and good life for our graduates, please reach out to us and let us know your questions so that we can either add to the series or answer them directly to you. Have a great night and thanks for joining.